Time and Time Again Recording by R.J. Davis Time and Time Again by Henry Beam Piper To upset the stable, mighty stream of time would probably take an enormous concentration of energy. But it's not to be expected that a man would get a second chance at life. But an atomic might accomplish both. Blinded by the bomb flash and numbed by the narcotic injection, he could not estimate the extent of his injuries, but he knew that he was dying. Around him in the darkness, voices sounded as through a thick wall. They might have left most of those Joes where they was. Half of them won't even last till the truck comes. No matter, as long as they're alive, they must be treated, another voice, crisp and cultivated rebuke. Better start taking names while we're waiting. Yes, sir. Fingers fumbled at his identity badge. Hartley Allen, Captain, G5, Chemical Research, AN-73-D, slash slash Serial SO-23869403J. Allen Hartley, the medic officer, spoke in shocked surprise. Why, he's a man who wrote Children of the Mist, Rose of Death, and Conqueror's Road. He tried to speak, and must have stirred. The coarsened voice sharpened. Major, I think he's part conscious. Maybe I better give him another shot. Yes, yes, by all means, Sergeant. Something jabbed Alan Hartley in the back of the neck. Soft billows of oblivion closed in upon him, and all that remained to him was a tiny spark of awareness, glowing alone and lost in a great darkness. The spark grew brighter. He was more than a something that merely knew that it existed. He was a man, and he had a name, and a military rank, and memories. Memories of the shearing blue-green flash, and of what he had been doing outside the shelter the moment before, and memories of the month-long siege, and of the retreat from the north, and memories of the days before the war, back to the time when he had been little Alan Hartley, a schoolboy, the son of a successful lawyer in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. His mother he could not remember. There was only a vague impression of the house full of people who had tried to comfort him for something he could not understand. But he remembered the old German woman who had kept house for his father afterward and he remembered his bedroom, with its chintz-covered chairs and the warm-colored patch quilt on the old cherry bed, and the tan curtains at the windows, edged with dusky red, and the morning sun shining through them. He could almost see them now. He blinked. He could see them. For a long time he lay staring at them unbelievingly, and then he deliberately closed his eyes and counted ten seconds. And as he counted, terror gripped him. He was afraid to open them again, lest he find himself blind or gazing at the filth and wreckage of a blasted city. But when he reached ten, he forced himself to look and gave a sigh of relief. The sunlit curtains and the sun-gilted mist outside were still there. He reached out to check one sense against another, feeling the rough monk's cloth and the edging of maroon silk thread. They were tangible as well as visible. Then he saw that the back of his hand was unscarred. There should have been a scar, souvenir of a rough and tumble brawl of his cub reporter days. He examined both hands closely. An instant later, he had sat up in bed and thrown off the covers, partially removing his pajamas and expecting as much of his body as was visible. It was the smooth body of a little boy. That was ridiculous. He was a man of 43, an army officer, a chemist, once a best-selling novelist. He had been married and divorced ten years ago. He looked again at his body. It was only 12 years old, 14 at the very oldest. His eyes swept the room wide with wonder. Every detail was familiar. The flower-splashed chair covers, the table that served a desk and catch-all for his possessions, 
the dresser, with its mirror stuck full of pictures of aircraft. It was the bedroom of his childhood home. He swung his legs over the edge of the bed. They were six inches too short to reach the floor. For an instant, the room spun dizzily, and he was in the grip of utter panic, all confidence in the evidence of his senses lost. Was he insane, or delirious, or had the bomb really killed him? Was this what death was like? What was that thing about ye become as little children? He started to laugh, and his juvenile lyrics made giggling sounds. They seemed funny, too, and aggravated his mirth. For a little while, he was on the edge of hysteria, and then, when he managed to control his laughter, he grew felt calmer. If he were dead, then he must be a disincarnate entity, and would be able to penetrate matter. To his relief, he was unable to push his hand through the bed. So he was alive. He was also fully awake, and he hoped rational. He rose to his feet and prowled about the room, taking stock of its contents. There was no calendar in sight, and he could find no newspapers or dated periodicals, but he knew that it was prior to July 18, 1946. On that day, his 14th birthday, his father had given him a light 22 rifle, and it had been hung on a pair of rustic forks on the wall. It was not there now, nor ever had been. On the table he saw the boy's book of military aircraft, with a clean new dust jacket. The fly leaf was inscribed, To Alan Hartley from his father on his thirteenth birthday, seven eighteen forty five. Glancing out the window at the foliage on the trees, he estimated the date at late July or early August, nineteen forty five. That would make him just 13. His clothes were draped on a chair beside the bed. Stripping off his pajamas, he donned shorts, then sat down and picked up a pair of lemon-colored socks, which he regarded with disfavor. As he pulled one on, a church bell began to clang, sent Boniface up on the hill, ringing for early mass. So this was Sunday. He paused, the second sock in his hand. There was no question that his present environment was actual. Yet, on the other hand, he possessed a set of memories completely at variance with it. Now suppose, since his environment were not an illusion, everything else were. Suppose all those troublesome memories were no more than a dream. Why, he was just little Alan Hartley safe in his room on a Sunday morning, badly scared by a nightmare. Too much science fiction, Alan. Too many comic books. That was a wonderfully comforting thought, and he hugged it to him contentedly. It lasted all the while he was buttoning up his shirt and pulling on his pants, but when he reached for his shoes, it evaporated. Ever since he had awakened, he realized, he had been occupied with thoughts utterly incomprehensible to any 13-year-old, even thinking in words that would have been so much Sanskrit to himself at 13. He shook his head regretfully. The just-a-dream hypothesis went by the deep six. He picked up a second shoe and glared at it, as though it were responsible for his predicament. He was going to have to be careful. An unexpected display of adult characteristics might give rise to some questions he would find hard to answer credibly. Fortunately, he was an only child. There were no brothers or sisters to trip him up. Old Mrs. Stauber, the housekeeper, wouldn't be much of a problem. Even in his normal childhood, he had bulked like an intellectual giant in comparison to her. But his father... Now there the going would be tough. He knew that shrewd attorney's mind, whitted keen on a generation of lying and reluctant witnesses. Sooner or later he would forget for an instant and betray himself. Then he smiled, remembering the books he had discovered, in his late teens, 
on his father's shelves and recalled the character of the open-minded agnostic lawyer. If he could only avoid the inevitable unmasking until he had a plausible explanationary theory. Blake Hartley was leaving the bathroom as Alan Hartley opened his door and stepped into the hall. The lawyer was bare-armed and in slippers. At 48, there was only a faint powdering of gray in his dark hair, and not a gray thread in his clipped mustache. The old merry widower himself, Alan thought, grinning as he remembered the white-haired but still vigorous man from whom he had parted at the outbreak of the war. Morning, Dad, he greeted. Morning, son. You're up early. Going to Sunday school? Now there was the advantage of a father who had cut his first intellectual tooth on Tom Paine and Bob Ingersoll. Attendance at divine services was on a strictly voluntary basis. Why, I don't think so. I want to do some reading this morning. That's always a good thing to do, Blake Hartley approved. After breakfast, suppose you take a walk down to the station and get me a Times. He dug in his trouser pocket and came out with a half dollar. Get anything you want for yourself while you're at it. Alan thanked his father and pocketed the coin. Mr. Stauber will still be at Mass, he suggested. Say I get the paper now. Breakfast won't be ready till she gets here. Good idea, Blake Hartley nodded, pleased. You'll have three quarters of an hour at least. So far he congratulated himself. Everything had gone smoothly. Finishing his toilet, he went downstairs and onto the street, turning left at Brandon to Campbell, and left again in the direction of the station. Before he reached the underpass, a dozen half-forgotten memories had revived. Here was a house that would in a few years be gutted by fire. Here were four dwellings standing where he had last seen a five-story apartment building. A gasoline station with a weed-grown lot would shortly be replaced by a supermarket. The environments of the station itself were a complete puzzle to him until he orientated himself. He bought a New York Times glancing first of all at the dateline, Sunday, August 5, 1945. He had estimated pretty closely. The Battle of Okinawa had been won. The Potsdam Conference had just ended. There were still pictures of the B-25 crash against the Empire State Building a week ago Saturday. And Japan was still being pounded by bombs from the air and shells from offshore naval guns. Why, tomorrow, Hiroshima was due for the big job. It amused him to reflect that he was probably the only person in Williamsport who knew that. On the way home, a boy sitting on the top step of his front porch hailed him. Alan replied cordially, trying to remember who it was. Of course, Larry Morton. He and Alan had been buddies. They probably had been swimming or playing commandos in Germans the afternoon before. Larry had gone to Cornell the same year that Alan had gone to Penn State. They had both graduated in 1954. Larry had gotten into some government bureau, and then he had married a Pittsburgh girl, and had become 12th vice president of her father's firm. He had been killed in 1968 in a plane crash. You go on a Sunday school, Larry asked, mercifully unaware of the fate Alan foresaw for him. Why, no. I have some things I want to do at home. He'd have to watch himself. Larry would spot a difference quicker than any adult. Heck with it, he added. Golly, I wish I could stay home from Sunday school whenever I wanted to, Larry envied. How about us going swimming at the canoe club this after? Alan thought fast. Gee, I wish I could, he replied, lowering his grammatical sights. I've got to stay home, Safter. We're expecting company. A couple of aunts of mine. Dad wants me to stay home when they come. That went over all right. Everybody knew that there was no rational accounting for the vulgarities of the adult mind. 
and no appeal from adult demands. The prospect of company at the Hartley home would keep Larry away that afternoon. He showed his disappointment. Aw, oh, jeepers creepers, he blasted me euphemistically. Maybe tomorrow, Alan said, if I can make it. I gotta go now, ain't had breakfast yet. He scuffed his feet boisely, exchanged so longs with his friend, and continued homeward. As he hoped, the Sunday paper kept his father occupied at breakfast to the exclusion of any dangerous table talk. Blake Hartley was still deep in the financial section when Alan left the table and went to the library. There should be two books there to which he wanted badly to refer. For a while, he was afraid that his father had not acquired them prior to 1945, but he finally found them and carried them onto the front porch along with a pencil and a ruled yellow scratch pad. In his experienced future, or his past to come, Alan Hartley had been accustomed to doing his thinking with a pencil. As reporter, as novelist plotting his work, as amateur chemist in his home laboratory, as scientific warfare research officer, his ideas had always been clarified by making notes. He pushed a chair to the table and built up the seat with cushions, wondering how soon he would become used to the proportional disparity between himself and the furniture. As he opened the books and took his pencil in hand, there was one thing missing. If he could only smoke a pipe now. His father came out and stretched in a wicker chair with a Times book review section. The morning hours passed. Alan Hartley leafed through one book and then the other. His pencil moved rapidly at times, at others he doodled absently. There was no question anymore in his mind as to what or who he was. He was Alan Hartley, a man of 43, marooned in his own 13-year-old body, 30 years back in his own past. That was, of course, against all common sense, but he was easily able to ignore that objection. It had been made before, against the astronomy of Copernicus, and the geography of Columbus, and the biology of Darwin, and the industrial technology of Samuel Colt, and the military doctrines of Charles de Gaulle. Today's common sense had a habit of turning into tomorrow's other nonsense. What he needed right now, but bad, was a theory that would explain what had happened to him. Understanding was beginning to dawn when Mrs. Stauber came out to announce midday dinner. I hope you won't mind how when it's so early, she apologized. My sister Jenny over in Nippinos she is sick. I want to go see her this afternoon yet. I'll be back in plenty of time to get supper, Mr. Hartley. Hey, Dad, Alan spoke up. Why can't we get our own supper and have a picnic like? That'd be fun. And Mrs. Stauber could stay as long as she wanted to. His father looked at him. Such consideration for others was a most gratifying deviation from the juvenile norm. Dawn of altruism or something. He gave hearty consent. Why, of course, Mrs. Stauber, Alan and I can shift for ourselves this evening, can't we, Alan? You needn't come back till tomorrow morning. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hartley. At dinner, Alan got out from under the burden of conversation by questioning his father about the war and luring him into a lengthy dissertation on the difficulties of the forthcoming invasion of Japan. In view of what he remembered of the next 24 hours, Alan was secretly amused. His father was sure that the war would run on to mid-1946. After dinner, they returned to the porch, Hartley Pierce smoking a cigar and carrying out several law books. He only glanced at those occasionally. For the most part, he sat in blue smoke rings and watched them float away. Some trice guilty Felton was about to be triumphantly acquitted by a weeping jury. Alan could recognize a courtroom masterpiece in the process of incubation. It was several hours later that the crunch of feet on the walk caused father and son to look up simultaneously. 
The approaching visitor was a tall man in a rumpled black suit. He had knobby wrists and big, awkward hands. Black hair flecked with gray and a harsh, bigoted face. Alan remembered him. Frank Guchall, living in, on Campbell Street, a religious fanatic and some sort of lay preacher. Maybe he needed legal advice. Alan could vaguely remember some incident. Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Goodshaw. Lovely day, isn't it? Blake Hartley said. Goodshaw cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Mr. Hartley, I wonder if you could lend me a gun and some bullets, he began embarrassedly. My little dog's been hurt and is suffering something terrible. I want a gun to put the poor thing out of its pain. Why, yes, of course. How would a 20 gauge shotgun do? Blake Hartley asked. You wouldn't want anything heavy. Gutchall fidgeted. Uh, uh, er, I was hoping you'd let me have a little gun. He held his hands about six inches apart. A pistol that I could put in my pocket. It wouldn't look right to carry a hunting gun on the Lord's Day. People wouldn't understand that it was for a work of mercy. The lawyer nodded. In view of Goodshaw's religious beliefs, the objection made sense. Well, I have a Colt 38 Special, he said. But you know, I belong to this auxiliary police outfit. If I were called out for duty this evening, I'd need it. How soon could you bring it back? Something clicked in Alan Hartley's mind. He remembered now what that incident had been. He knew, too, what he had to do. Dad? Aren't there some cartridges left for the Luger, he asked. Blake Hartley snapped his fingers. By George, yes. I have a German automatic I can let you have, but I wish you'd bring it back as soon as possible. I'll get it for you. Before he could rise, Alan was on his feet. Sit still, Dad. I'll get it. I know where the cartridges are. With that, he darted into the house and upstairs. The Luger hung on a wall over his father's bed. Getting it down, he dismounted it, worked with rapid precision. He used the blade of his pocket knife to unlock the end piece of the breech lock, slipping out the firing pin and buttoning it into his shirt pocket. Then he reassembled the harmless pistol and filled the clip with 9mm cartridges from the bureau drawer. There was an extension telephone beside the bed. Finding Goodshaw's address in the directory, he lifted the telephone and stretched his handkerchief over the mouthpiece. Then he dialed police headquarters. This is Blake Hartley, he lied, deepening his voice, carrying his father's tone. Frank Guchall, who lives at, take this down, he gave Guchall's address, had just borrowed a pistol from me, ostentatiously to shoot a dog. He has no dog. He intends shooting his wife. Don't argue about how I know there isn't time. Just take it for granted that I do. I disabled the pistol, took out the firing pin, but if he finds out what I did, he may get some other weapon. He's on his way home, but he's on foot. If you hurry, you may get a man there before he arrives and grab him before he finds out the pistol won't shoot. Okay, Mr. Hartley, we'll take care of it, thanks. And I wish you'd get my pistol back as soon as you can. It's something I brought home from the other war, and I shouldn't like to lose it. We'll take care of that, too. Thank you, Mr. Hartley. He hung up, carried the Luger and loaded clip down to the porch. Look, Mr. Gushaw, here's how it works, he said, showing it to the visitor. Then he slapped in the clip, yanked on the toggle loading the chamber. It's ready to shoot now. This is a safety. He pushed it on. When you're ready to shoot, just shove it forward and up, and then pull the trigger. You'll have to pull the trigger each time. It's loaded for eight shots. And be sure to put the safety back when you're through shooting. Did you load the chamber, Blake Hartley demanded? Sure, it's on safe now. Let me see. His father took the pistol, being careful to keep his finger out of the trigger guard, and looked at it. Yes, that's all right. 
He repeated the instructions Alan had given, stressing the importance of putting the safety on after using. Understand how it works now, he asked? Yes, I understand how it works. Thank you, Mr. Hartley. Thank you, too, young man. Guchal put the Luger in his hip pocket, made sure it wouldn't fall out, and took his departure. You shouldn't have loaded it, Hartley Pierre reproved, when he was gone. Alan sighed. This was it. The masquerade was over. I had to, to keep you from fooling with it, he said. I didn't want you finding out that I'd taken out the firing pin. You what? Guchal didn't want that gun to shoot a dog. He has no dog. He meant to shoot his wife with it. He's a religious maniac. Sees visions. Hears voices. Receives revelations. Talks with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost probably put him up to this caper. I'll submit that any man who holds long conversations with the deity isn't to be trusted with a gun, and neither is any man who lies about why he wants one. And while I was at it, I called the police on the upstairs phone. I had to use your name. I deepened my voice and talked through a handkerchief. You, you, Blake Hartley jumped as though bee stung. Why did you have to do that? You know why. I couldn't have told him this is little Alan Hartley, just 13 years old. Please, Mr. Policeman, go and arrest Frank Guchal before he goes root toot toot at his wife with my papa's luger. That would have gone over big now, wouldn't it? And suppose you really want to shoot a dog. What sort of mess will I be in? No mess at all. If I'm wrong, which I'm not, I'll take the thump for it myself. It'll pass for a dumb kid trick, and nothing will be done. But if I'm right, you'll have to front for me. They'll keep your name out of the pit, and they'd give me a lot of cheap boy hero publicity, which I don't want. He picked up his pencil again. We should have the complete returns in about 20 minutes. That was a 10-minute understatement, and it was under a quarter hour before the detective sergeant who returned to Luger had finished congratulating Blake Hartley and giving him the thanks of the department. Before he had gone, the lawyer picked up the Luger, withdrew the clip, and ejected the round in the chamber. Well, he told his son, you were right. You saved that woman's life. He looked at the automatic clip and then handed it across the table. Now let's see you put that firing pin back. Alan Hartley dismantled the weapon, inserted the missing part, and put it together again, then snapped it experimentally and returned it to his father. Blake Hartley looked at it again and laid it on the table. Now, son, suppose we have a little talk, he said softly. But I explained everything, Alan objected innocently. You did not, his father retorted. Yesterday you had never thought of a trick like this. Why, you wouldn't even have known how to take this pistol apart. And at dinner, I caught you using language and expressing ideas that were entirely outside anything you've ever known before. Now, I want to know, and I mean this literally. Alan chuckled. I hope you're not toying with the rather medieval notion of obsession, he said. Blake Hartley started. Something very like that must have been filtering through his mind. He opened his mouth to say something, then closed it abruptly. The trouble is, I'm not sure you aren't right, his son continued. You say you find me changed. When did that you first notice a difference? Last night, you were still my little boy. This morning, Blake Hartley was talking more to himself than Alan. I don't know. You were unusually silent at breakfast. And come to think of it, there was something... Something strange about you when I saw you in the hall upstairs. Alan, he burst out vehemently, what has happened to you? Alan Hartley felt a twinge of pain. What his father was going through was almost what he himself had endured in the first few minutes after waking. I wish I could be sure myself, Dad, he said. You see, when I woke this morning, I hadn't the least recollection of anything I've done yesterday. 
August 4th, 1945, that is, he specified, I was positively convinced that I was a man of 43, and my last memory was a lying on a stretcher, injured by a bomb explosion. And I was equally convinced that this had happened in 1975. Huh? His father straightened. Did you say 1975? He thought for a moment. That's right. In 1975, you will be 43. A bomb, you say? Alan nodded. During the Siege of Buffalo in the Third World War, he said, I was a captain in G-5 Scientific Warfare General Staff. There'd been a transpolar air invasion of Canada, and I'd been sent to the front to check on service failures of a new lubricating oil for combat equipment. A week after I got there, Ottawa fell, and the retreat started. We made a stand at Buffalo, and that was where I copped it. I remember being picked up and getting a narcotic injection. The next thing I knew, I was in bed upstairs, and it was 1945 again, and I was back in my own little 13-year-old body. Oh, Alan, you just had a nightmare to end nightmares, his father assured him laughing a trifle too heartily. That's all. That was one of the first things I thought of. I had to reject it. It just wouldn't fit the facts. Look, a normal dream is part of the dreamer's own physical brain, isn't it? Well, here is a part about 2,000% greater than the whole from which it was taken, which is absurd. You mean all this Battle of Buffalo stuff? That's easy. All the radio commentators have been harping on the horrors of World War III, and you couldn't have avoided hearing some of it. You just have an undigested chunk of H.B. Calderborn raising hell in your subconscious. It wasn't just World War III, it was everything. My four years at high school, my four years at Penn State, and my seven years as a reporter at the Philadelphia Record, and my novels. Children of the Mist, Rose of Death, and Conqueror's Road. They were no kid stuff. Why, yesterday I'd never even have thought of some of the ideas I use in my detective stories that I published under a nom de plume. And my hobby chemistry? I was pretty good at that. Patented a couple of processes that made me as much money as my writing. You think a 13-year-old just dreamed all that up? Or here? You speak French, don't you? He switched languages and spoke at some length in good conversational slang spice Parisian. Too bad you don't speak Spanish, too, he added, reverting to English. Except for a Mexican accent you could cut with a machete, I'm even better there than in French. And I know some German and a little Russian. Blake Hartley stared at his son, stunned. It was some time before he could make himself speak. I could barely keep up with you in French, he admitted. I can swear that in the last 13 years of your life, you had absolutely no chance to learn it. All right, you lived till 1975, you say. Then all of a sudden you found yourself back here, 13 years old, in 1945. I suppose you remember everything in between, he asked. Did you ever read James Branch Cabell? Remember Florian de Plachang in the high place? Yes, you find the same idea in Jurgen too, Alan said. You know, I'm beginning to wonder if Cabell mightn't have known something he didn't want to write. But it's impossible. Blake Hartley hit the table with his hand so hard that the heavy pistol bounced. The loose round he had ejected from the chamber toppled over and started to roll, falling off the edge. He stooped and picked it up. How can you go back against time? And the time you claim you came from doesn't exist now. It hasn't happened yet. He reached for the pistol magazine to insert the cartridge, and as he did, he saw the books in front of his son. Dunay's experiment with time, he commented, and J.N.M. Tyrell's science and physical phenomena. Are you trying to work out a theory? Yes, it encouraged Alan to see that his father had unconsciously adopted an adult-to-adult -adult manner. 
I think I'm getting somewhere, too. You've read these books. Well, look, Dad, what's your attitude on precognition? The ability of the human mind to exhibit real knowledge apart from logical inference or future events. You think Dunay is telling the truth about his experiences? Or that the cases of Tyrell's book are properly verified and can't be explained away on the basis of chance? Blake Hartley frowned. I don't know, he confessed. The evidence is the sort that any court in the world would accept if it concerned ordinary, normal events, especially the cases investigated by the Society of Physical Research. They have been verified. And how can anyone know something that hasn't happened yet? If it hasn't happened yet, it doesn't exist. And you can't have real knowledge of something that has no real existence. Tyrell discusses that dilemma and doesn't dispose of it. I think I can. If somebody has real knowledge of the future, then the future must be available to the present mind. And if any moment other than the bare present exists, then all time must be totally present. Every moment must be perpetually coexistent with every other moment, Alan said. Yes, I think I see what you mean. That was Dunay's idea, wasn't it? No, Dunay postulated that infinite series of time dimensions, the entire extent of each being the bare existent moment of the next. What I'm postulating is the perpetual coexistence of every moment of time in this dimension, just as every graduation of a yardstick exists equally with every other graduation, but each at a different point in space. Well, as far as duration and sequence go, that's all right, the father agreed. But how about the passage of time? Well, time does appear to pass. So does the landscape you see from a moving car window. I'll suggest that both are illusions of the same kind. We imagine time to be dynamic because we've never viewed it from a fixed point. But if it is totally present, then it must be static, and in that case, we're moving through time. Well, seems all right, but what's your car window? If all time is totally present, then you must exist simultaneously at every moment along your individual lifespan, Alan said. Your physical body and your mind, and all the thoughts contained in your mind, each at its appropriate moment in sequence. But what is it that exists only at the bare moment we think of as now? Blake Hartley grinned. Already he was accepting his small son as an intellectual equal. Please, teacher, what? Your consciousness, and don't say what's that, teacher doesn't know. But we're only conscious of one moment, the illusionary now. This is now, and it was now. And when you ask that question, and it'll be now when I stop talking. But each is a different moment. We imagine that all these nows are rushing past us. Really, they're standing still, and our consciousness is whizzing past them. His father thought that over for some time. Then he sat up. Hey, he cried suddenly. If some part of our ego is time-free and passes from moment to moment, it must be extra-physical. Because the physical body exists at every moment through which the consciousness passes. And if it's extra-physical, there's no reason whatever for assuming that it passes out of existence when it reaches the moment of the death of the body. Why, there's logical evidence for survival, independent of any alleged spirit communication. You can toss out patient worth, and Mrs. Auburn Leonard's feta, and Sir Oliver Lodge's son, and Wilford Brandon, and all the other spirit communicators, and still have evidence. I hadn't thought of that, Alan confessed. I think you're right. Well, let's put that at the bottom of the agenda and get on with this time business. You lose consciousness as in sleep. Where does your consciousness go? I think it simply detaches from the moment at which you go to sleep 
and moves backward or forward along the line of moment sequence to some prior or subsequent moment attaching there. Well, why don't we know anything about that? Blake Hartley asked. It never seems to happen. You go to sleep tonight, and it's always tomorrow morning when we wake. Never day before yesterday, or last month, or next year. It never, mm, or almost never, seems to happen. You're right there. Know why? Because if the consciousness goes forward, it attaches to a moment when the physical brain contains memories of the previous consciously unexperienced moment. You wake, remembering the evening before, because that's the memory contained in your mind at that moment. And back of it are memories of all the events in the interim, see? Yes, but how about backward movement like the experience of yours? This experience of mine may not be unique, but I never heard of another case like it. What usually happens is that the memories carried back by the consciousness are buried in the subconscious mind. You know how thick the wall between the subconscious and conscious mind is. Those dreams of Dunay's and the case of Tyrell's book are leakage. That's why precognitions are usually incomplete and distorted and generally trivial. The wonder isn't that good cases are so few, it's surprising that there are any at all. Alan looked at the papers in front of him. I haven't begun to theorize about how I managed to remember everything. It may have been the radiations from the bomb, or the effect of the narcotic, or both together, or something at this end, or a combination of all three. But the fact remains that my subconscious barrier didn't function and everything got through. So you see, I am obsessed by my own future identity. And I've been afraid that you'd been, well, taken over by some, some outsider, Blake Hartley grinned weakly. I don't mind admitting, Ellen, that what's happened has been a shock. But that other, I just couldn't have taken that. No, not in stage sane, but really, I am your son, the same entity I was yesterday. I've just had what you might call an educational shortcut. I'll say you have, his father laughed in real amusement. He discovered that his cigar had gone out and relit it. Here, if you can remember the next thirty years, suppose you tell me when the war's going to end. This one, I mean. The Japanese surrender will be announced at exactly 1901, 7.01 p.m. present style, on August 14, a week from Tuesday. Better make sure we have plenty of grub in the house by then. Everything will be closed up tight until Thursday morning, even the restaurants. I remember we had nothing to eat in the house but some scraps. Well, it is handy having a profit in the family, I'll see to it that Mrs. Stauber gets plenty of groceries in. Tuesday a week. That's pretty sudden, isn't it? The Japs are going to think so, Alan replied. He went on to describe what was going to happen. His father swore softly. You know, I've heard talk about atomic energy, but I thought it was just Buck Rogers stuff. Was that the sort of bomb that got you? That was a firecracker to the bomb that got me. That thing exploded a good ten miles away. Blake Hartley whistled softly. And that's going to happen in thirty years? You know, son, if I were you, I wouldn't like to have to know about a thing like that. He looked at Alan for a moment. Please, if you know, don't tell me when I'm going to die. Alan smiled. I can't. I got a letter from you just before I left for the front. You were 78 then, and you were still hunting and fishing and flying your own plane. But I'm not going to get killed in any battle of buffalo this time. And if I can prevent it, and I think I can, there won't be any World War III. But you say all time exists, perpetually coexistent and totally present, his father said? Then it's right there in front of you, and you're getting closer to it every watch tick.
Alan Hartley shook his head. You know what I remembered when Frank Goodshaw came to borrow a gun, he asked? Well, the other time I hadn't been home. I'd been swimming at the canoe club with Larry Morton. When I got home, about half an hour from now, I found a house full of cops. Goodshaw talked a 38 officer's model out of you and gone home. He'd shot his wife four times through the body, finished her off with another one back of the ear, and then used his sixth shot to blast his brains out. The cops traced a gun. They took a very poor view of your lending it to him. You never got it back. Trust that gang to keep a good gun, the lawyer said. I didn't want us to lose it this time. I didn't want to see you lose face around Kent City Hall. Guchals, of course, are expendable, Alan said. But my main reason for fixing Frank Guchal up with a padded cell is that I wanted to know whether or not the future could be altered. I have it on experimental authority that it can be. There must be additional dimensions of time, lines of alternate probabilities. Something like William Seabrook's Witch Doctor Friends, fan-shaped destiny. When I brought memories of the future back to the present, I added certain factors to the usual chain. That set up an entirely new line of probabilities. On no notice at all, I stopped a murder and a suicide. With 30 years to work, I can stop a world war. I'll have the means to do it, too. The means? Unlimited wealth and influence. Here. Alan picked up a sheet and handed it to his father. Used properly, we can make two or three million on that alone. A list of all the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont winners to 1970. That'll furnish us primary capital. Then, remember, I was something of a chemist. I took it up originally to get background material for one of my detective stories. It fascinated me, and I made it a hobby and then a source of income. I'm 30 years ahead of any chemist in the world now. You remember IG Farben Industry? Ten years from now, we'll make them look like pikers. His father looked at the yellow sheet. Assault at eight to one, he said. I can scrape up about 5,000 for that, yeah. In ten years, any other little operations you have mind, he asked. About 1950, we start building a political organization here in Pennsylvania. In 1960, I think we can elect you president. The world situation will be crucial by that time. And we had a good-natured non-entity in the White House then who let things go till war became inevitable. I think President Hartley can be trusted to take a strong line of policy. In the meantime, you can read Machiavelli. That's my little boy talking, Blake Hartley said softly. All right, son, I'll do just what you tell me. And when you grow up, I'll be president. Let's go get supper now. That concludes the reading of Time and Time Again by Henry Beam Piper.